All right, in El Paso, the El Paso Film Festival is uh, getting underway, and the featured guest this year is uh, filmmaker, auteur, uh, I would say, Robert Rodriguez, who's one of our favorites, of course. And uh, the film festival is going to be presenting uh, Robert Rodriguez's new film, Red 11, and there's going to be a filmmaking master class. That's coming up today at 7 o'clock, and it's going to be at the Plaza Theater. Uh, good morning, Robert. Hey, how are you? And good morning to the entire Rodriguez family that's here today. Yeah, we're family here. Good morning, good morning guys. It's uh, Rebel and Racer who are here. Um, tell me about the master class, uh, first of all. Like, what is that? Is that a talk? Is it a Q&A? Or, or what, what are you going to do? Yeah, I, t I, I did it. This is a 25th anniversary of El Mariachi, yeah. a movie I made. With no crew back Shoe in the stream. day, that seven thousand kind of dollars famous revolutionized right? independent yeah. filmmaking because it showed somebody could make a movie with nothing. And uh, to celebrate it, I thought, well, let's do it again. And, and um, I brought my son Racer on board. But I thought instead of writing a book about it, that book Rebel Without a Crew was very influential to filmmakers and even people not making films, just who wanted to learn how to take on a challenge that was impossible and overcome it. Right. Rebel Without, Rebel a, Without a, a Crew was all about the making of mm -hmm. a film. Very and I found people in all walks of life were inspired by it. So I thought, well, instead of them just reading about it, let's do a documentary so people can see it. Because seeing is believing. Mm -hmm. See the finished product and you see the process, it suddenly you can do it. And so we documented it, and the documentary is like two and a half hours long. So what the master class is, is just about 30 minutes of highlights and me talking. So it's about an hour total to fill in the blanks so that you could see the whole process, how to write, shoot, edit, cut, score a film. Well, you make it sound easier than I imagine. When you see it, <laughs> you suddenly, you, you will want to quit your job. Most, it's very dangerous to go watch this thing. People want to quit their job and go make a film. Because then afterwards, we show the actual film. And even though you just saw how we did now, it. You, we're talking about Red, Red 11. 11. Right, yeah, you okay. see Red 11. And uh, you can't believe that that's the movie we made, even though you just saw us make it. It takes on a life of its own, as uh, all creative projects tend to do. And it's very, very inspiring for, for people to watch. And fun, very fun. It's funny. And it's about the medical research hospital stint I did to pay for El Mariachi. That's what Red 11 is. Yeah. I did medical research studies to make the $7,000. And so it's about that time in my life, taken from notes and diaries from that time period. So, um, What kind of experiments did they do? Oh, well, that's all in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, the, the best one was... Now does do, was does one of your sons here. play you? He plays one like me. There is someone who plays a character that's basically me. Yeah. Rebel here plays one of the other characters fascinated with knife making, which he is for real. Really? That young age. Where <laughs> when you go into those hospitals, you have all kinds of dreams of what you're going to do with the money afterwards. I was going to be a filmmaker. Someone else wants to be a composer. Someone else wants to be a knife maker. And and, uh, and you know, you're all going to be just back in there the next month. Because <laughs> you don't really have any place to go. But it, it was uh, the drug I remember doing. Um, the oh, the scariest the one was stuff. the one that was... Uh, it was a speed healer they were testing. So mm -hmm. to test it, they have to wound you. And they show that in the movie, too. He gets the same thing. They cut holes in your arms and put speed healer one, placebo on the other. So you back up after seven days to go do tests on it, and they give you... That was that one paid $2,000 for seven days. Okay, which that's back, pretty good. I mean, back in 90, you know, 91, that was a lot of money. And, I, and I needed that money to pay for my movies, because I already had three jobs and was going to school full-time, and... There was, was this no extra money. Was this in Austin? This was in Austin. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They still have places like that. Right by the university. Can they you give me some references? <laughs> <laughs> you can get in. <laughs> They're always looking for subjects. They have always they have to test every drug that comes out on the market for like seven years before it can come out. How long is is it a full length movie? Is it a yeah, uh, it's yeah. a feature. It's about it's the film's short, it's about eighty minutes and it moves really fast. But it, it takes you through uh, to make it more interesting for the behind the scenes, I kept adding things to make it more you know, just making it about me in the medical research hospital it would be it's funny. But I thought, let me turn it into a thriller so that there's more tricks of the trade shown from the behind the scenes. So in the movie, a guy goes into the medical research hospital, this college kid, to make $7,000, and then he's not sure if they're trying to kill him or if it's side effects from the drug. Oh, so it turns right. into a whole mental thriller and uh, action film. So um, I noticed that there are different events, and some of them are free, and some of them cost money. So Carlos, do you want to... Carlos Corral yeah, it's put here together at the El Paso, El Paso Film, Film Festival. Sure. Yeah. 
So how about tonight to go and, and take the master class and see Rat 11? Uh, so the master class tonight, it's at the Plaza Theater, 7 p.m., and tickets are only 20 bucks at the Plaza Box Office, so anyone can come. Okay. Uh, and, of course, if you do want to come to the entire festival, we do have uh, VIP badges available, uh, and that gets you into the whole festival. Um, we have feature films that start Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and they're at the Philanthropy Theater. Tickets are 10 bucks. And, of course, if you want to see all the free stuff, we have short films playing at the El Paso Museum of Art. Are, are most of these films from uh, local or regional? I'd say half of the lineup is uh, El Pasoans. Uh, not just local here, but El Pasoans who are in L.A., New York, Austin. Uh, so I try to keep in touch with a lot of El Paso filmmakers, uh, no matter where they are. So a lot of the programming, about half of it, is theirs. And then we've also got other filmmakers that I've been trying to attract to come to El Paso because uh, we've had filmmakers who drive through El Paso going to Los Angeles, and they've always told me, oh, I love the mountains there. So I'm like, oh, i, I got to figure out an excuse to bring you here then. So uh, that's kind of what the El Paso Film Festival is doing, is kind of growing the independent scene here uh, on the far edge of Texas. Have you been to El Paso before, Robert? My mom is from El Paso. Oh, your mom's from El Paso. Yeah, but I haven't been here myself since I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, well, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to come back and remember. Okay, so your first movie, El Mariachi, let's talk about that a little bit. $7,000, yeah. you got it from being a lab rat, yeah basically your most recent movie i think i heard 200 million yeah well, to make a lead battle eight close was, like 150 or so but it's still the biggest budget i'd ever worked with the biggest movie I ever shot in texas we so shot it in austin you've done both of them yeah you know seven thousand and hundreds of millions yeah. of dollars is it still the same craft when you're yes, talking you're about still, that <laughs> you're still yeah, you're, you're still, still doing, basically the, same doing thing. the same thing you're still trying to make magic happen and create something that wasn't there before and tell a story. Yeah. Um, the kind of story you can tell when you're doing Alita is, well, the, the lead doesn't even have to exist. You can be completely made out of a computer because um, you have the money to go get yeah. Weta to design something that you would never be able but to see. there was an actress. Yes, with the yes but control. as far as the face and, and, yeah. the, and the world that you're building, where you take something like Red Eleven, it's like, okay, you, you go backwards. You go, what do I have around me? And let me write a story about that. Like, if you were making a film, it would take place at a radio station. It, probably <laughs> it would use these hallways, and it would be some kind of a thriller. or be zombies. Done here. I yeah, zombies, right now. zombies are coming it in, and they're taking over the radio, and then suddenly the ratings go up. <laughs> <laughs> and they decide not to get rid of the zombies because they weren't yeah, cheap. They're, like, they're just so much entertaining. <laughs> they just talk about all you of know, the you, ghosts you that come we up, have. You, you suddenly start coming up with a, a bunch of ideas, almost when you have limitations. So for mine, it was, uh, oh, yeah, let's do Red 11 because the hallways of my office look just like that hospital. I'll just shoot it in the hallways of my studio. And so it was really, doing, it was actually less money than Mariachi. And it came out a month after Alita. <laughs> at, uh, we first screened it at South by Southwest. It went to Cannes. Everyone, all these festivals have been asking for it. So we've been touring the world with it. And it's the only place you can see it because I enjoy just showing it to the audience of the festivals for now until we release it. I have heard of something called the Rodriguez list method. And what that is is you list cool stuff you have available yes, to you yes. and then make a movie based on, yeah. oh, I have this awesome car. Yeah. Tell me how that works. Well, the reason is because a lot of people will say, well, I want to make a movie, but I don't have the, they thought Their list is the opposite. Their list is what they don't have. All right. And that keeps them from ever making anything. Where if you turn around and look at well, what do I have and let me use that um, don't put it something in that you don't have that way otherwise you're just spending money that you don't have and you'll never get it made and a lot of filmmakers heard that advice after Mariachi came out and took it to heart like Kevin Smith always credits Mariachi for inspiring him to do clerks because he thought wow that's really smart here I, I work at a convenience store <laughs> right. I should just make a movie here at this convenience store and that was clerks um, so there have been low budget movies before, you know, in the seventies. Just 70s not that with, low. I mean, the that. lowest budget movie at that time that I saw was uh, Spike Lee's "She's Got to Have It," which is at least two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand yeah. dollars, and that's very cheap. But still, who's got that coming out of their pocket when you're twenty one years old? So um, even seven thousand, I had to go make it by being a lab rat. I didn't have that money. Yeah. So uh, to, to fund a film, it's, it can be really expensive. And I thought, there's got to be another way. Because I, I, was, I was shooting in, on the early video cameras, and you didn't need a crew. You didn't need sound or anything. You could just go do it. So I shot the film that way. I just did it with a film camera and, and innovated a new way of shooting that didn't require any of the stuff they taught you at film school. So this master class shows you a filmmaking method that I did way back in Mariachi and kind of refined since then. They, they don't teach anywhere. 
So it's really eye-opening for people to come in and see it, and, and it inspires them to go take on an impossible task. And I talk about the benefit of it, and you see it in the documentary. It really inspires you to go do something and do it with your kids. Yeah. My kids exploded after making that. He's now full-time composing. He's full-time writing and producing. It just really showed them. By the way, these were the, the creative these are the works. kids that created Shark Boy and Lava yes. Girl, right? <laughs> and, and, and they played Shark Boy and Lava Girl in in, <laughs> in the original film as the young. He played Shark Boy in the little in the original film, the two youngest versions of Shark Boy. So they've been around the business for a long time. Well, um, I'm a lover of movies, and you know there are a lot of filmmakers. That, you know, I, I think everybody that gets into filmmaking loves movies, right? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> You've got to have a love for it. Yeah. Um, do you like the superhero movies? Oh, yeah, because, I love those. Because, yeah. you know, two of my favorites of all time, Martin Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola, kind of dumped on him and said they're not cinema. And I thought, well, maybe they're not, but, you know, I don't want to see a generational mob epic every time I go to the theater either. Right, right, right. Well, you know, those guys... At the same time, I would never completely. want to say anything remotely negative about Francis Ford Coppola or <laughs> oh, yeah, Martin no, those Scorsese. Guys are, I know those guys are really cool, and, they, and they've been in the trenches of, and created that, that kind of cinema, literally in the 70s, that just revolutionized cinema and what movie going could be and what movies could be. Um, I love... The superhero movies because they are um, and not just because they're superhero movies that I remember when I first saw Superman in 1977 that was amazing yeah and you'd never seen somebody fly before uh, that, I still remember the feeling of seeing something that special and that was like the first big superhero movie ever done but the one since uh, I think uh, the guy running that studio in Marvel Kevin Feige is just amazing to have done, done that many films that all kind of tie together that easily could just fall apart and not work at all i mean I mean, there are the so many they can't there work. are so <laughs> many ways that could have that could have gone, gone wrong rails, it's right. like it's it's almost like a miracle so I, I i do enjoy to see and i was enjoying watching them come out and and stay on the roll and go man there's no way they're gonna be able to stick the landing they just had too much of a good run and then they did so uh, i'll go you one better i i thought well, they're not even picking out the main heroes. They're picking up a bunch of bench warmers like the Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, <laughs> I never read Guardians of the Galaxy, and I read a lot of com. And then it's like, oh, it was great. Yeah. <laughs> what do I know? Yeah. Well, the first one, I mean, the first one out of the gate in that series was uh, John Favreau's Iron Iron Man. Iron Man was awesome. I thought that was terrific. I was a big fan of his. All and right. uh, when he took that on, I thought, wow, he he just he, he kind of set that whole direction of having them have that independent film spirit. And casting and, and quirkiness with the big special effects. That's what he brought to it. Do you got a few minutes or are you you up against, uh, you know, you got to head out? Yeah, I got a few minutes. All right, stick around. We'll talk some more with Robert Rodriguez. And El Paso Film Festival is getting underway. Uh, the featured guest is, is a big one this year. It's Robert Rodriguez, who's in the studio with us. And tonight, you could go and see his new film, Red 11, and there's a master class of filmmaking. Where uh, where Robert shows how you you make a you make a film on the cheap and make it look good, and I guess it makes everybody want to become uh, a <laughs> filmmaker. Is that is that what's going on uh, yeah. with your sister Patricia? Oh yeah, she she would hear me talk about it for so many years that she started shooting and showing me. She come every time she had a new film or video or anything that she would do, she'd bring it over to my house, say, put it on the big screen. And we'd watch it, and then and, and she's just been it's becoming more and more often. And yeah. she's been going all over the world, winning awards and festivals for her videos and short films. And uh, I didn't even know she was until a couple of days ago. She was in this festival. <laughs> <laughs> well, she is. <laughs> so I was like, wow. So now my parents are coming up because my mom's from El Paso. So we're it's a family affair this weekend. Are you San Antonio? Is where you grew up? It's where I grew up. Yeah, we all grew up in San Antonio. I went to Austin for college and just kind of stayed there. It was a super creative household growing up. I mean, yeah. was was you know doing filmmaking something that was you know kind of fit in with your upbringing? Yeah, I mean, my dad you know sold cookware and real estate for for a living. My mom was a nurse, but they were both. Well, that sounds very normal. Okay, here musicians. comes part two. So my dad was like a jazz drummer originally. My mom played guitar, and so there was everyone in the family either has a musical instrument they play or a band there's several that have bands or something in the creative arts besides their regular 
Day. Which of which of uh, the boys are musical or both? Uh, Rebel Racer. Both of us actually, but yeah. Rebel's the composer. He's the one who uh, currently scores a lot of our projects right now. Yeah, he did the score for Red Eleven as well. The entire score. I didn't expect that. <laughs> and how do, how do you do that? Um, I mean, do you do you do it on? Like, what is the equipment, or what is uh, your process, I guess? Yeah, so for uh, for this one, I worked from my computer with a keyboard. And okay. I was a pianist growing up, so I was very comfortable with a keyboard. And so I just, I just kind of worked it out like that. It's a, it's a synth-based score, and yeah. so uh, I had to learn a lot about synth and <laughs> a lot about everything, really. I mean, starting out on this movie, I didn't really know much about making music and composing, but... You know, it's a really interesting process is when you get take on one of these projects like this, you don't have the time, really. And, I mean, you won't ever really have the time if you don't make it. And I got so into this process of composing for the movie that I actually started to make time for it. And before I knew it, I was really getting into it and putting all my effort into it and really making it something. So I was I'm, blown away. He played me this stuff in it. And- I grew up on like John Carpenter scores and stuff. That's my dream score for this movie. Well, John he, Carpenter did his scores. He would right? do his scores, yeah. but since he took piano for since he was you know for thirteen years, he he played me something that he did, and I thought, wow, that's that's amazing. He goes, oh, well, this is easy. This is just dad music. It's the stuff you're always playing in your car. It's just there's just these notes here. <laughs> <laughs> he showed me how simple that music was, but there's something about the simplicity, and he layered it and made it so much better than the stuff I used to you know be inspired by. So. He's now full time doing music scoring for me. All right, tell me about this studio. You've talked about it a couple of times. It sounds huge. You did Alita Battle Angel yeah, at your got studio a in Austin. Thirty acres studio in Austin because the the old airport. I mean, the airport moved, so the old airport had some hangars. So I took over hangars twenty years ago. A couple of hangars where the governor would keep his plane, and shot Spy Kids and Sin City and everything there. So we've got our props and then and and all our all our movie props and things from over the years but also the parking lot was huge so we built a 90,000 square foot set for Alita the exterior of that whole city and it's still standing there I told him hey leave it up because we can use it for other things <laughs> so when you go there it's its largest standing set in the in the country it's amazing do you know what you're going to use it for yet we used it in red 11 <laughs> oh okay all right <laughs> oh for just some dream sequences he's supposed to be in mexico though we don't have to go to mexico and go right here into our <laughs> parking lot it looks like we painted it up to look like mexico it actually looks a lot like the the town in my first movie el mariachi oddly enough alita is setting up for a sequel for sure right oh, we'd at, love to make a sequel well disney bought fox but hopefully they they want to go for it i know they loved it so Hopefully, we'll make another one. And James Cameron was a part of that, which, yeah. uh, you know, you're both filmmakers I love, but I would not think of you at the same time, you know? And that's funny, <laughs> only because he, he went on and making such bigger and bigger movies, but we actually started very much the same way. I mean, he, he came from the craftsmanship of production design and... Well, wasn't and, he a uh, Russ the, Meyer guy? The, on the Roger Corman. Roger Corman, thank you. But his early movies were really independent low budget movies like terminator were very low budget and he did a lot with very little so he has that same background scrappy do it yourself come out of nowhere background into the hollywood system it's just he's been so successful you know you forget that that's who he was but he still has that as part of his dna so he and i have been friends for over 25 years we've we always were friends because of that, because of that background of do it yourself. He he operates the camera too. He he put an editing machine in his house after he saw I had one in my house, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, that's uh, just how we've always been. Give me an update on the film scene in uh, Austin. I figure you're kind of like the son of that solar system, but uh, was there what was the scene like when you when you first decided you were going to make your films based in Austin? I really just wanted to stay home. You know, I, I didn't want to have to move to Los Angeles, and I had made a mariachi out of my apartment. So when I sold it, I thought, wow, maybe I don't have to move there. I'd love to stay in Texas and build up the film community around me rather than have to go try to fit into someone else's. And started from the ground up because I had a whole different methodology of filming where I could make a movie look bigger with less money. So I, I rather than go and trying to convince them that they were setting their ways on how to do this method, I just start my own studio. So I started my own studio in Austin, and um, the film community built up around us. Richard Linklater was at the same time yeah. filming movies there. 
we he decided to stay in Austin as well. We just kind of became regional filmmakers, and Dave's that really helped confused. boosted it. Right, right. And then Austin, as Austin grew, everybody wants to shoot there. So more and more movies and TV shows, and a lot of commercials actually shoot there. You know? How how would your career you think have been different if you'd have just said, well, you know, L.A. You go to L.A. if you're going to make movies. Do you think uh, totally different? It would have been a totally different, different trajectory completely. Being outside of the box, you. Th- and George Lucas told me this later, and I became friends with him. He said, um, "It's great you're in it's great you're in Austin. That's why I'm in Marin County. When you live outside of the box of Hollywood, you think outside of the box automatically. You'll just innovate because you'll be so far from tradition that you'll question everything. And sure enough, we were shooting digital before anybody green screen movies. We shot the first digital 3D movie it was actually Spy Kids 3. That was actually the first digital 3D movie that brought 3D back. Yeah. And that was just an idea I had. I just thought, hey, I want to make 3D come back. Um, but being so far from the industry, you could try things and nobody would be around to say, no, we don't do it that way here. <laughs> you know? So you could come up with things and, and innovate whole new methodologies. And that's what was the, uh, my whole career would have been different had I, done, had I been in LA. I wouldn't have made Sin City out there. I wouldn't have even thought of it. Yeah. Uh, so, so I guess I hear that Tarantino's making Star Trek. Would you ever want to make a Star Wars? I don't know. Star <laughs> Wars are great movies, but um, those are hard to make. <laughs> they gotta, look hard. You've got to you've got to answer to so many different people. I like the freedom of mm-hmm. creating something from the ground up that's yours. Yeah, you know, like when I make Spy Kids or Desperado or. I, those are my movies. So, yeah. but even when you do something you like that, a Sin, wrong. when you do a Sin City or an Alita, which you know had existed before, but they don't come, you know, preloaded with, with all, all this preloaded. stuff. With, yeah, right. and then you have a partnership with just that filmmaker. Like me and Jim were already friends. Frank Miller and I were great friends, and we enjoy collaborating together and, and making it come to life. We didn't have anybody else there saying, "No, it should be full color," <laughs> right. or you know. Man, yeah, maybe it shouldn't be. I don't green like that screen. color of yeah, yellow. No, you would never, <laughs> you would never come up with something new. All right, so the master class tonight, and then uh, th- there's going to be a showing of Red Eleven. It's only twenty dollars, and you get the tickets at the uh, Plaza Theater. Uh, Carlos, do you want to mention uh, any of the other stuff, or just uh, direct people to a website to see everything that's going on with the El Paso Film Festival? Yeah, our website is www.elpasofilmfestival.org. Uh, our schedule is online, and uh, yeah, starting uh, Friday, we uh, start having uh, documentary films, uh, narrative feature films, all in the Philanthropy Theater, and uh, our short film program also is at the El Paso Museum of Art. Again, it's the El Paso Museum of Art is completely free, so. Come one, come all. Uh, but uh, I also hope that other people will come out to some of the documentaries and the narrative films uh, that we have playing. I want to feature uh, two of them, actually. Uh, Friday night, we actually have one called Kindred Spirits, which was shot in Austin. But the filmmakers are all local, and the post-production for that film was actually done here in El Paso. So we'll be playing that 7 p.m. at the Philanthropy. And then at 9.45 is a film that I saw at South by Southwest. It was one of the midnight films. It's called Porno. Not to be confused with an actual porno, it is just a movie about uh, a film where five teenagers find a uh, th- they find a an old film reel, they play it, and they release a succubus demon. It's actually a very very great movie. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, well, thank you for putting on the film festival, Robert. Thank you for coming in, Absolutely. being the featured guest. Thank you. Rebel and Racer. Nice to meet you guys. Great to meet you. Thank you yeah. so much. Have you ever been to El Paso before? Your grandma is from here, you know. No, this is our first time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, there's, uh, there's a lot to see and do, so have a good so visit. And uh, thank you guys for taking the time to Absolutely. drop by. Thanks, All right. Uh-